With data types, you'll see some data is just better than others. And so there's two basic types of data we tend to use. The first is quantitative, which is our preferred. So this one is going to ultimately consist of numbers. Because it consists of numbers, this tends to be more consistent. So if I measure something and you measure the same thing, our numbers should be, if not identical, very close. Whereas qualitative is going to really focus more on words. And so if you're trying to describe somebody just using words and not using numbers such as weight and height, now it gets a bit trickier. So if you say somebody's tall or somebody's handsome or somebody's uh, skinny, I don't know exactly how tall that is. I don't know exactly what their weight would be. I don't know exactly what handsome means, nor if it's going to be handsome for everybody or just you happen to find them handsome uh, or if you're blind. I don't know. And so with science, we almost always will try to focus on quantitative just because it's more likely to be accurate across the board. It's less likely to change from person to person. So an example, we can say a large bubble formed. And this is something a lot of people might say. That's a large bubble I just saw. You know, that was a really big cloud over there. But that doesn't let us know anything exact. I can't say now you recreate how big that bubble was from me telling you it was large. You might have a huge range of bubble sizes that people come up with. Versus if I say the bubble was 2.1 centimeters. If I say 2.1 centimeters, you can pull out any you know ruler, uh, meter stick, and you could find that spot and say, okay, that was how big it was and everybody should be able to agree. That's why we prefer quantitative measurements whenever possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you know, you're measuring things and it's very difficult to go through and turn into numbers, but that's why scientists try so hard. You know, Sometimes they'll make a rubric where they'll say, all right, if I'm measuring activity, what I'm gonna do is just say one is like no activity at all and five is like running as fast as they can. And so we'll try to turn something that's kind of an eyeball test of how much activity into a number just to make it easier to work with because we love to deal with numbers versus words and, as a scientist. Now organizing your data is one of those critical pieces after you've done the experiment. So we've done the experiment, we know what we changed, that's our independent variable, so we're going to put that on the left because this is what we controlled. Okay, remember this is the cause. And then on the right hand side next to it we're going to put the dependent variable. And this might be multiples because you might do multiple different trials. So I might, you know, get a reading after one minute, two minutes, three minutes. And then you'll see that we averaged it, called the mean, at the end here. Because you normally want to make sure that there's not one weird measurement screwing stuff up. So you want to get a lot of measurements and average them out to make sure it's accurate. And you'll notice here too, I always put the unit. Because you don't want to just tell me that a person is eight tall. I need to know eight what? Centimeters, meters, kilometers. So make sure whenever you put anything down here, you always put the unit, and we do put the unit in parentheses. That's the standard way of doing it. So if you're writing this, I might say coffee per day, and then in parentheses, I might just put cups, just so we know that it's cups of coffee per day. And so that way down here, I can either write zero cups if I felt like it, or I could just write zero because I know that zero is tied to cups. But you gotta make sure that there's a unit uh, in some cases, people will leave the unit off here and just put them down here. I'm not going to freak out if you do that, but the best way is to just make sure you always put the unit in parentheses after whatever you're describing, just so we know. We want to make sure that doesn't get lost. And then once you construct the data table in this way, it makes it fairly easy for us to then have the data all organized. You know, that's what we're after here is other people because you're going to publish your work. You're doing this so other people can look at it too. Other people can now look at this and easily kind of pick out this information. They can fairly easily see all your data combined into a convenient format. That's why we have this kind of a uh, set way of going about constructing data tables. You also want to make sure you put a title up top and make sure it's descriptive. Don't get fancy, you know, like coffee short people. You need to go through and describe what it is. So if you're making a data table at the top of something like this, you might want to label it uh, effect of coffee drinking on height. That got sloppy as I went, but that'll still work. And so that way it's very clear when another scientist looks at this, they can look at the title of that data table and figure out exactly what information it contains. They're not looking to laugh or for something humorous. They're just looking at what is this data table going to convey to me so that I can 
get as much information as possible as quickly as possible from it. Now, data tables are great, but they can end up being walls of numbers, and that can be very difficult to sort through. So one of the ways to get around that is to go through and graph to visualize the data. And when you do this, you could have where thousands of measurements that you know just seem to go up, down, all over the place, they start to form patterns. And so you can start to see that, you know, in this case, you're getting where the CO2 amounts drop, then rise, drop, then rise. And they do it in very, very consistent patterns. You know, they rise to about the same amount, they drop to about the same amount over about the same amount of time. And that makes it easier to see too if there's anomalies where you can see that something is no longer dropping properly, it keeps going up and it goes up farther than it used to. So it helps us take a lot of data and, and discover patterns and discover anomalies so that we can understand what's going on as fast and easily as possible. This is another reason that scientists love graphs as well as data tables. This is another reason that we make sure that we set them up in a particular way, uh, which we'll discuss in the next slide, to make sure it's easy for us to access these graphs for an experiment and pretty much discover everything about that experiment in no time. You know, scientists can be a bit lazy too. We don't want to read through everything. We like to get to the important parts. So when we're graphing, you're going to once again make sure you have a good title. That's just a default for pretty much everything. But when you're graphing, you're always going to put the dependent variable on the left, the y-axis. So this is once again what we measured. And then you're going to put the independent variable so this is what we actually changed, that's gonna go on the bottom. So there is a particular way of doing this. And sometimes people like to use this acronym, dry mix. Uh, just remember the dependent variables on the y-axis, and then you have the independent variable on the x-axis. If you have other books that you look to, sometimes people call the dependent variable the responding variable. So that's the other reason dry mix is good, because dependent or responding variable goes on the y. And sometimes people call the independent variable the manipulated variable. So the manipulated or independent variable goes on the x. So with our book, we just say dependent and independent. But if you're using a different book, uh, or if you've seen this before, perhaps in middle school when they went over stuff, you might have heard responding and manipulated. It's the same basic idea, it's just another name for it. And then lastly, because we'll when we do labs, we'll go more over those as well. I'll get you guys used to practicing that. But lastly, I just want to do some final definitions here. And I do this because a lot of people don't get the idea of what exactly a theory is. We've discussed a hypothesis, what that is, testable. But a lot of people throw theory around as though it's just any old idea. And in science, a theory is about as close to being completely positively true as we are able to understand as you can get. So it's going to be an explanation. Theories are always explanations. By definition, a theory is an explanation of some natural phenomena that is supported by tons of research. It's supported by many, many, many different experiments that all provide evidence that support the idea that this is the proper explanation. Now, if new evidence comes to light, theories can be thrown out or modified to make sure they reflect the current evidence. So we don't say in science typically that anything's absolute, but things can be the most supported for what we have now. So when we talk about gravity, it's not that people have to so much believe in gravity, but gravity is what all of the data supports right now. So scientists use the concept of gravity because it's the best concept we have to match reality. And so for a theory, that's what we're talking about. When I say theory scientifically, you should think this is the best thing that we have and it right now at least, perfectly fits all the evidence that there is. Now a law is kind of interesting because some people get these confused. A law is more just observations that we always see or mathematical relationships that we always see. They're not an explanation. It's more just like what goes up must come down. You know, we have this law of gravity because we know that things when they go up, they'll move towards the body, they'll fall back down. But that doesn't explain why. It's the theory of gravity that ultimately explains why things fall back down. So when we talk about hypotheses, theories, and laws, just realize they're three separate things. Hypothesis is more like your initial prediction. You know, it's something you're gonna test. A theory is an explanation that's been tested, it's been ultimately checked, and right now it, it's perfect for right now. And a law is going to be more of a relationship mathematically or an observation. 
It's just kind of what we see all the time. This is what we witness. That's it for 1-3. Hope you guys enjoyed it.